Hi, I'm Laurel Gillespie, Director of Advanced Care Planning in Canada Initiative with the Canadian Hospice Palliative Care Association. And today we're going to be having a conversation with Joy Werda from Dragonfly Advisory Services based out of Northern Ontario. So Joy has two decades of experience as a public servant and founder of Dragonfly Services and now also serves as a death doula to continuously advocate for choices for those dying. Working to build strong relationships with the community for better end-of-life care, Joy's passion and drive has led her to a more holistic approach to dying, and it is her wish that everyone has the opportunity to have the best death possible for their end-of-life journey. So today we welcome Joy Werda. Hi, Joy. Hi, thank you so much. It's so warming to be able to spend the day or spend a few hours with you um, just discussing some important components in life. Yeah, and I can't tell you how um, wonderful it is when you have people with who are similar or like minded um, to share these important discussions with because it, it just lends to to show that um, it is an important uh, subject matter to cover and, and thank you for what you do out in the community to help improve quality of life and end of life care for, for people who are at the end of their journey. So to tell you a little bit about Joy, who's in front of us here, she is the owner of Dragonfly Advisory Services, um, which is an aftercare program designed to assist families with the overwhelming tasks after death has occurred. Um, and as a death doula, it is her desire and responsibility to assist in educating, support, um, comforting, and occasionally advocating for those who are dying. Her continuing passion for her Northern Ontario community has led her to work with and educate her community on the options of advanced care planning and what they present um, to help start healthier conversations around death and dying. So Joy discovered when you were young, you, ha you have, I just have to say, you have quite a story. Um, and, and grief is nothing that, that was new to you from a very early mm -hmm. age. And um, you discovered at quite a young age that you were adopted uh, at birth, and that was really your first experience with grief. And then to suddenly lose your adoptive father um, when you were in your 30s um, from an unexpected and, and major stroke, um, you, it left you feeling robbed of the opportunity to know really what his final wishes were. Uh -huh. um, and then your adoptive mother was diagnosed with lung cancer six weeks after um, the, the funeral of your, of your father. So your family had time, um, to prepare this time with your mom. Um, but it was still, and it, I can only begin to appreciate how traumatic that must have been to have to, to work your way through that and navigate. Um, so, but your mom did pass away peacefully in her sleep about six months after that. And uh, again, I, I, I can only just begin to imagine how tremendously difficult that must have been. But you admit that you, you struggled, you really struggled with that grief and, and it brought you to saw, seek out um, professional counseling help with your partner and, and husband. Um, so through these experiences, um, you did learn how to navigate the system and you knew what was important today and, and what could wait until tomorrow. And you wanted to use what you've learned um, in order to help others. So, you know, for that, on behalf of myself, thank you for sharing because it's through sharing and educating that we learn. Um, and, and through sharing those experiences, we can help others. So, so I, I would like to thank you for that. And I'm Thanks. sure that others are very appreciative of the great work that you're doing. Um, so I guess to begin our conversation today, I wanted to start out by, by asking you, um, how you first learned about advanced care planning and, and how you were first introduced to that concept. So for me, I was in my thirties. I can honestly say, I didn't know what the term advanced care planning was. I didn't even know what palliative was, right? We're in a demographic or an aging where we're focusing on what's the best car to buy, you know, your relationships, your, uh, your loved ones, you're, you're falling in love, you're having families. But those conversations, I can honestly say for me in 2006, never took place. So for advanced care planning, my first open, my first eye opener was in 2006 with the passing of my dad. We didn't know what his wishes were. I had no idea did he even have a will. We hadn't had those conversations. My parents were planning an Alaska cruise, right? It was very sudden, unexpected. I was the oldest of four, with four children. 
And I remember that day when we had to make decisions um, in the hospital room and, you know, you get called into that environment with everyone and we're sitting around the, the boardroom at the hospital, you know, the doctor's explaining the stroke. And, and again, it wasn't my world. It wasn't my realm. I, I didn't have any understanding of what even a stroke was. Like I, I kind of knew you read articles, you educate, but I didn't really understand the overall impact it would have on our family. And my mom turned to me and she's like, what would you want? You're so much like your dad. What would you want to do right now? And I was just heartbroken. I'm like, whoa, I mean, I'm supposed to be heading to the arena for my son's hockey game. And I'm sitting in a hospital room trying to figure out what my dad would want. Again, you know, you fast forward. And that was my first eye opener about advanced care planning and palliative. Do we take them home? Do we, do we, you know, remove the feeding tube, which was the choice we made. It was, yeah, we could have, it just, that wouldn't have been a quality of life for him. So we made a choice for us as a family and I kind of pioneered that conversation. If I fast forward into my mom's environment, um, six weeks later, I swear those, that roommate probably thought we were vultures walking into that hotel, into that hospital room of my brother and I, because right away we had that document with us, right? Mom, okay, what do you want? Like we cremated with dad, like what are your wishes? Would you, you know, who's going to be your executor right away? I'm sure because they didn't understand the over the dynamics of the situation. They had no idea that we were rush, rushing into advanced care planning the best way we knew how, because we had never had, we were Googling even if Google was the familiar term at that time, we were going back to those resources, aunts and uncles saying, hey, how do we do this? Like my dad had a will, it was in a Bible. It was very simple, right? It was, so it, that was my first journey into a conversation for advanced care planning and palliative care. I truthfully, in my 30s um, today, my kids are, my youngest is gonna be 30 soon and our oldest is in her 30s. I have those conversations every time I have an opportunity, you know, make sure you update your will just like you every year go through it. So now we're learning more as we grow and age, but that was my first conversation in advanced care planning was sitting in a boardroom. I didn't even understand what they were asking. That's, that's really, really, um, it's, it's I, I, again, it's just such a roller coaster that your whole family was on and for you to have to take the helm and, and to make those hard decisions with your dad and, and then your mom, um, you know, having been diagnosed and, and finding herself in a certain and a, a, a similar circumstance, I guess, with mm-hmm. trying to convey or have those important conversations about what someone's wishes are. And, and you know, we we didn't talk about that, you know. 15 years ago or 10 years ago as much as as we are today which is which is a very positive thing I think and then you know for me with being the youngest of eight you know, my dad had been ill for a long time and I think it, he had had his last rights read four times <laughs> it was like um you know so there was some laughter and some 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 lightheartedness around that um and as well as the serious side but it's hard having those conversations until you're in the moment. And I think in some of the preliminary things that I read is that you said, you know, we always think we have more time. Mm -hmm. We always think we have more time. We always think we have more time for everything. Oh, I'll get to that on the weekend. And then we never do. But, and this is one of those things. And I'm glad that you brought up that it's something that, you know, you visit with your own children periodically and remind them that throughout life's milestones, um, which is kind of the theme around our, our fall campaign, um, is that, yeah, every time you have reached a milestone and something changes, your wishes may change too. So it's something that not only once you start engaging in advanced care planning, it's something that should be revisited often. So exactly. I'm glad anyway that you had the opportunity, at least I'm with your mom and that she was open to that perception. But I can only imagine, as you say, like what the other family must have thought, right? Yeah. Perception is just Exactly. Exactly. So where how did you get from from that to starting Dragonfly Services, advisory services? So as what was you're that, s- uh, yeah. sorry. So, no, no, not at all. Sorry. Um, that process took time, right? It was a I was an I didn't understand I was dealing with grief at that time. 
I just went through the emotions, right? You're a mom, you're a, a, you're a coworker, you're a, a, a spouse, you're a friend, you're a sister, you're, you're, you're so many hats in this world, so many hats in an individual person. As years progressed, we had more deaths around us. Um, my mother-in-law had dual citizenship, which was unique uh, in her, you know, for that journey. Um, we were executors, so we learned as we developed. Then we had an, a family member who was very close who stepped into some roles when my dad had passed. You know, those milestones that we talk about, the weddings, the births, um, that supportive, you know, you go, go team, you know, that, that support system in the sisterhood. And he died very unexpectedly, went in the hospital that morning at 10, died at four. Um, so that was that first moment where uh, the family, we had been already dealing with so many losses as deaths as we age, which is actually very normal. We reached out to say, hey, can you give a hand in? And she was trying to make a change to beneficiary. And all of a sudden, we're in an electronic world in an aging demographic right? She just wanted to change the beneficiary on a policy. And my mentality was overwhelmed with grief. He had just like, I will use the term loosely, but he had just died. And she's more worried about, okay, now who's going to take care of things if I die? And she was focusing on things that were important to her, right? It's her journey. So I, I assist the families and I, we put it on speakerphone and we're like, okay, um, let's see what we can do. Can you please send it in paper? She's not very, she plays pogo, but she doesn't use the computer for everyday work. Uh, so they, they finally agreed. And I went home and I reached out to funeral directors locally. At this time, I'd already had a relationship, right? My, my mother-in-law had passed, my father-in-law had passed, my parents, uh, family, immediate family and, and extended and I said, is there any way that can help families when someone is going through these emotions, these, this roller coaster, this tsunami? And he's like, let me get back to you. He reached out. He goes, no, maybe a paralegal lawyer. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a Northern Ontario girl, born and bred. Not everyone has that luxury of a portfolio, right? We're talking blue collar workers. Yeah, we might, might have a lot of trucks in Northern Ontario, but I'm not going to say that there's probably some, you know, multi-million dollar mansions running around. So I was very frustrated at that answer. And my brother, who was a very strong piece in developing Dragonfly with me, um, and I had been in the public service for quite a few decades, so I had that integrity and understanding of what the need was. He's like, so what are you going to do about it? And you can sit here and complain like we do when you don't vote, right? Don't complain about politicians if you haven't ever voted. If you don't, if you're not making an impacting statement, and then what are you going to do about it? So that was that moment of ha ha, you know what? And there was a dragonfly that on my dad's funeral, being a northern girl, had always, um, it, we went fishing after my dad's funeral and this dragonfly stayed with us all day. And I grew up on the water, so dragonflies were impacting. And I remember my husband asking, we went kayaking that morning. Remember, I'm a northern girl. Uh, and this dragonfly was on this kayak with us. And we're just back in Cape Real in our community on the kayak. And my husband's like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, I don't know. And, you know, I got a good life. <laughs> I do. Do I want to, you know, I'm reaching I'm in my late 40s. Do I want to start becoming an entrepreneur and making change? And, and this dragonfly was with us. Finally, we loaded up the kayaks. And I'm like, hey, buddy, you got to go. Like, I don't want you to get stuck in the truck. You got to fly. I came home, pulled in the driveway. I looked at him. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to make change. And I am going to go if tomorrow, take the day off work. I'm going to go talk to the city, find out how do I start a business and Dragonfly will be in that work. Somewhere in that name, Dragonfly is going to be there. And that's, that's how we started. And that's I thought it was going to be like Avon. <laughs> truthfully oh, I'll have a little small business on the side but I didn't realize that how I was feeling in my journey there was so many of us feeling the same way that that was that support in our community that was like okay yeah we can do this and that's how we started I'm so glad that you did um and, and 
it's just I love the I love the 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 dragonfly that just that just stayed with you all day and it's it's kind of funny how you have those little moments throughout life where it's like yeah okay I need to do this and it's thank goodness for the dragonfly that followed you home right and and pushed you a little bit to to realize your potential and and your not just your little side business but it's really an enterprise that you're building and helping to alleviate the suffering of many right there are so many people who so many souls who are walking around us every day who are internally just suffering inside and and they need they need that guidance and that help and that wisdom and so for for individuals like yourself who have that inner resiliency and that strength um, and that fortitude to want to make a difference and help um, joy is one of the greatest things that you could ever do I think um, as a human being and to help alleviating that suffering and pain and, and act as a guide for others um, through your own um, experiences right so that's it's just such a great story I'm so so happy for this opportunity to chat with you so uh, that kind of leads into the next next sort of the question and curiosity about um, telling us more about what you're doing and and your your company that you started or your um, your I guess endeavor to help others um, is that grief is something that many people struggle to address and work through um, and how do you approach the concept of grief following your own experiences? How do you, how do you bridge that with, with other individuals? Um, there was a, an individual that I was working with a little while back who actually had a really good motto. Um, put down the telephone, pick up a cup of tea, right? Sometimes that's all we need to do. If we're working with families and individuals and they're going through a bad day, it's a bad day. Call it what it is. We're allowed to have those moments. So we'll be, if that's all we need to do is sit and have a cup of tea that day, then that's okay because that's what that person needs. I, we have a tendency, uh, you know, there's, there's two pieces I look at. We have a palliative care where that individual is the, takes ownership, right? Pal it's a term. We still have a person that we're working with. Those families, that integrity of that individual is here today. Let them have a voice. Let them speak on what their wishes are. Have healthy conversations. Learn to address um, the needs as they are. When a death has occurred and we're transitioning over into that other world of paperwork and, and, and you know, the, the logistics of after someone has died, then that grief process is different. But there's still the grief process when someone is also experiencing the loss of a loved one. And I know loss is kind of that terminology. It's like they're not lost, they're dying. And, and I try to be as, call it as it is, as much as possible. But we're always working to make sure that the families understand, regardless if it's palliative or an aftercare, our death doulas or a supportive role, that you have it's my mom had this saying and i use it a lot is if have your pity party then pick up your big girl panties and move on right it's okay even today there'll be milestones today's my dad's birthday right have my pity party i'm allowed it's it's okay to grieve there's nothing wrong with shedding a tear showing emotion i can guarantee you i have cried with many clients i may never even have met the person who have died um, because it may be an aftercare piece, not necessarily a death doula role. At that time, that's emotions okay, right? It, it, it's, as long as it's not about you, then that's the most important factor, is letting the person know that grief is a normal process. We will have a tsunami of emotions. It doesn't have to be bottled up. And then there are ways to navigate that grief into a positive way whenever possible. And it's not, a, it's not a perfect science. I think we have that tendency to think that we're gonna buy the book at Amazon, we're gonna read it and everything's gonna be okay. My personal experience was when my son went away to post-secondary. My parents had been dead for years, right? And when my son went away, to he was in high school when my dad died to my mom. Grade nine, if I can cry. So when he left me to go to, not that he left me, right? He's still here. But in my mind, when he left me to go away to school, that was my bottom, bottom barrel. That was my breaking point. That was the end of all. That was that tsunami of grief. Everybody I loved had left. And that was that 
moment where my husband's like, you, honey, need to talk to someone. That was my first experience of, wow, grief can hit you. And when you least expect it. And I had never grieved properly for the loss of my parents because I was the oldest. It was my responsibility. It was my job to make sure everybody was okay. And I never took care of me. So when I say, put down the phone and have a cup of tea, that's exactly what I'm saying. It's okay to sit back and know that it, tomorrow could be a better day, but today's a bad day. Have a cup of tea. Grieve. You've, somebody you love so close to you has now left this world. But they're still with us one way or another. Whatever your thoughts, beliefs, religions, maybe everybody has a, 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 their own story. So just, res just respect the journey. And I think that's an important part of what we try and establish is it's okay to grieve. That's so well, well put. You, you articulated that so well in that, you know, giving, giving yourself permission to just feel the way you feel and and being okay with that and saying you know tomorrow I often have caught myself lately saying tomorrow is another day I've done everything I can today but tomorrow is another day right yeah <laughs> um, but when um you know it really resonated with me when when you spoke of your son when you become like an empty nester um you're right it, it's like and and if I can, if I can share a bit of an impartiality, I guess, as a, as a woman, as a mom, um, you know, you tend to, you have a different, sometimes you have different roles within the household. It's not the same for everybody, but you, you tend to be the fixer, the mender, you make everything better. You're a public, you know, you worked in the public service, you're an organized person and, you know, you have all your ducks lined up in a row. Um, it, it really catches you off guard when suddenly you don't have those other people, you know, your, your husband, your partner is probably very self-sufficient and can take care of himself. But as a, as a mom, I guess you feel that impending need to always be taking care of something and nurturing it and supporting. And then all of a sudden that role is pulled out from under you. That's another, another thing that people are experiencing, you know, not just the loss of, of someone passing, but grief shows its ways um, and, and appears in many different uh, stages or different parts of our life, um, not just the loss of a, of, of a loved one, but um, I just wanted to reflect back on something you said earlier where, you know, working, working, I guess, working, being, representing, you know, as being sort of the, the matriarch of the family and taking that leadership role and taking care of everyone's business. It makes me think that one day I would love to see this whole, you know, the stigma around talking about death and dying for starters, and there's still very much a stigma around that and a stigma around, whoosh, let's not talk about grief. Um, it's, t it's not um, something we should be talking about. Keep your feelings inside and don't let anyone see. But I think there's, there's like this really big imbalance between, you know, it, even within our workspaces is that, you know, here's your three days off or your one week off of work, but then you have months of the administrative side of things to look after. And sometimes it can be very complicated as you, you explained earlier. And I'd love to see one day that we um, are able to build such compassionate communities and com compassionate companies that recognize that three days isn't going to do it and five days off work isn't going to do it. And sometimes it's very individual to what that family's needs are or whatnot. And I'd love to see um, our governments be more supportive of that around um, caregiver time off and, and so on and so forth. And we've started to move in that direction, but I'd love to see it that, you know, individuals have more time to really reflect and resonate and, and, sit back and figure out what their path and dealing through their, their grieving process is going to look like. Cause some people are going to take more time than others, obviously yeah. before they're able to, but if people can sort of begin to become more mindful of being sort of on the same page and saying, you know, what, what is it that you need? How can I help you? But what do you need from me? It, you know, and having that it, cup of just putting the phone down and just having the cup of tea and, and being present for someone else. Um, you, Laurel, you bring up a, a, absolutely an important factor. And I think that change starts with us. And I remember doing a presentation a little over a year ago with financial planners. 
and I was talking about advanced care planning, healthy conversations, and right, they have the perfect opportunity. They have those clients coming into their office, uh, making their their investments and, and their portfolios, whatever it may be, maybe it's an RSP, uh, first home buyers, maybe it's an educational fund, but they have that opportunity to start those conversations. Um, I remember doing a life insurance policy on myself, beneficiary with my two children, and I'm, I'm separating and, and he made a comment, you know, oh, you know, you're gonna, and I'm like, yeah, you know, just nothing major, just enough, a little bit. And, um, because my, my mindset is if there's anything left when I die, I did it wrong when I was alive. So I, I remember sitting there saying, this was for my kids to grieve. And he looked at me and he goes, what? And I'm like, my children both have, are very well, they have, my daughter's a customs and immigration. So she has a federal, you know, package. And then my son works for a wonderful company that have bereavement leave. Not like you say, three days, five days, seven, it's not enough. I wanted them to have something in writing that would allow them to take a leave from work so that they can grieve for me or my husband or whatever their needs are the best way possible. It's not a paycheck at the end of the day, but I want them to be able, because what I went through, I worked for the federal service. I was a public servant. I had bereavement leave, but it still wasn't enough. And it, 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 today we need to make change, but I think that change can start with us. So when we make these choices, we can look back and have these healthy conversations. I'm not going to say if grandpa's at Christmas and you're having dinner and he says, you know, I got to talk about my will and I got to make, that's, Christmas dinner's not the time to do it. But it might be the perfect opportunity to say, hey, grandpa, how about tomorrow morning we have coffee? Let's sit down and talk about it. Let's see what you really want and how can we make this happen for you? And that conversation starts with us. So Sorry. True. No, no, no. I, I love, I love, I, and this is the, the nice part about having these conversations is we are able to touch on, on things that maybe other people aren't thinking about and, you know, change only happens. And I, I think I shared with you um, prior to us re recording or taping our, our interview is that um, I shared that quote my mom shared with me as a, a bit of a social justice warrior years ago. She said, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said, your life begins to end the moment that you become silent about the things that really matter. That's right. And and that makes a difference. So thanks for, for sharing. And I hope one day we'll get there. One day, not we tomorrow will. is another day and we'll just keep going on. Um, but I wanted to give you the opportunity. Was there anything else um, that maybe you'd like to share during our conversation that you feel people should know when it comes uh, to working through grief in tandem with advanced care planning and palliative care in general? I think the biggest takeaway for me over the last four years doing what we've done and making conversations happen is it, there's no perfect science. There's no there's just put your first step forward, make, start with you. If it's happening with you and you're feeling this way or overwhelmed, I can promise you there's somebody else feeling the same way. Know that it's okay to reach out, to call a friend, to talk to someone, not to take that pain yourself. There's not necessarily, I know COVID has played a part right now for how we're dealing with communication and unloved ones, but um, you know, reach out on the telephone. No, it's okay to say the word. Say the, your name, the name. I, I just had a friend who lost a, a, a close friend early in their 40s last Friday. And when she reached out in the morning, I said, it's okay to say her name, right? She, don't be afraid to, to recognize that somebody you love is no longer with you. Well, you have an opportunity now and you see the challenges that are occurring because until you've walked the walk, I don't really know if everybody understands the talk. I think that's important, right? I walked it very early. I didn't understand it. I had had friends lose parents, but okay, I guess it sucks, right? I didn't understand the overwhelming piece. So I think it's important for us just to be able to understand that we're not alone. And there is a way to take that grief and make a positive. It's sometimes, like you say, it's just making a small change and having a conversation. But that conversation starts with each and every one of us. It could be your child's getting their driver's license. Are you an organ donor? Right? That's as small, that's as easy as it can start. 
And then from yes, there, <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. That yeah. that's that's that perfect. They're 16 years old. They haven't had a conversation yet. Grandpa, I work with Northern Ontario School of Medicine. Um, the physicians that are graduating haven't even lost a goldfish, a dog, right? They're young. And so being able to work and bring these conversations to new physicians, there's ways. It's just think outside the box and but no understand that you're not alone because we're not you know there's that makes me think of two things so that's i have i have a dream <laughs> good we all should I, love, I have a dream about um and it's but going back to when i did my mba i, I had a like a high level, higher level marketing course and we had to come up with an idea to, to market a, a product a brand something but market it and i wanted to choose we had to have it vetted by our professors and i wanted to do it on advanced care planning and it was like you know, it's far too complicated. And I just say, he said, like, this isn't a thesis. It's just a, like a 10,000 word paper or whatever. And I was like, oh, but I really, really want to do it. And I did it anyway. Um, but part of my, my research in it was I thought, like, how do you respect all those provincial and territorial jurisdictional differences and the provinces get to keep their autonomy over things? It's so simple as we have a QR code on our health card or, and or our driver's license. If we have both. Um, and it has your organ donation all there. It has any advanced directives that you might have, but it has your advanced care plan. Um, all that information can be just put on a QR code on your health card. So that's my goal one day is I'd like to get there. But when you mentioned the organ donation in high school, I'd love for them to start talking about, you know, those basic fundamental life skills like finances and thinking in terms of being becoming an adult and having autonomy over making important decisions for yourself. And it can start as simple as you're 16, you have a driver's license. If something were to happen, do you want to be an organ donor? Um, and that's something new. I think that's just, you know, the last couple of generations um, mm-hmm. that that's really become a, um, an automatic or a very simplified process um, to make those kinds of decisions. But I, I wanted to add that I, I think when it comes to advanced care planning, just to kind of wrap the, this up, because I know you have a busy schedule ahead of you today, is that um, when it comes to advanced care planning, it's normalizing those conversations. And, and then for people to understand is this is for everyone. It's not just for those who are terminally ill or um, on at the end of their journey. It's for everyone to think about and to think about throughout the span of your life. And um, I can't thank you enough um, for sharing your time. Thank you. Thank you. And I think the one thing I I just recalled and I remember Riley mentioning, you probably think of something, was understanding the difference between an advanced care planning, a substitute decision maker, your directives, and a will. I've come across so many scenarios in the last four years. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm their power of, you know, personal care. Okay, where's the will, right? The individual has now is deceased. Again, the lingo, the communication, if you've never walked it, you may not understand it. So learn to um, educate, right? And, and if you're not sure, ask so that you understand because I made it very clear. My husband is not my substitute decision maker. I want him to be able to make decisions healthy. It would not be in his best interest for him to be my substitute decision maker, right? Finding that trust person, that person. And for some spouses are great, you know, significant others, family. Make a choice that works for you because there's no right or wrong, but at least have one. That's so right. And that education piece is is so critical. And it's it's like a puzzle and there's all these different pieces, but Nobody's yep. sure how many pieces there are to begin with, but touching back on that in Northern Ontario at the medical school that's there and, you know, some of the medical students who haven't even lost a goldfish, let's say, um, and not to slight that, but I think as a society, we've come to sort of rely on our medical community and our healthcare professionals to do a lot of this work for us. And I think the autonomy, it, it comes back to us. We need to take ownership over this. These are our wishes, our values, what we want and it's being able to express that in a safe and trusting environment and you're so right that sometimes your significant other may not be the best person to make those crucial difficult um, decisions for you especially during what is already a difficult time Um, but yet all comes down to the the education piece and I'd love to still see that advanced care planning becomes a normal curriculum 
uh, piece to medical training, whether you're a paramedic, a nurse, a PSW, a physician, whatever. That's an important piece, but also uh, from the public's perspective is that we need to take some responsibility on taking care of our own business and getting our own ducks in a row and not relying so heavily. Yes, we should rely on the healthcare professionals to guide us and provide the detailed information about health issues and options and prognoses, et cetera. But they shouldn't be responsible for us to do our advanced care planning. That to me doesn't make sense. <laughs> They're already inundated and have enough on their plates. Um, so I'd like to see there be a bit of a shift in mindset is that, yeah, this is about what I want. So I should take some, um, some care and, and thought of, around that. But, um, no, you're so right, I can, Laurel. I can see that <laughs> maybe we have, maybe we have to have a part two to this. Uh, the, the, we could, we could go on for days. I mean, the pivot's happening, right? We're starting getting our ducks in an order. Like you say, we're, we're getting there. We are. I see, I've seen so much happen in the last couple of years. And I'm so proud that so many Canadian citizens are making change they're opening up the conversation. It's not what it was when my parents died. I'm not my mom, right? I'm my daughter. Got you well, you got your kids, right? Like everything in order, you know, and it's to help alleviate the stress when that untimely event happens for you because shit happens. Call it as it is, Laura. it will, and it will suck. So let's help prevent that today. Exactly. That's, perfectly put and what a great way to uh to close off our our conversation today but i think joy maybe there's the ours opportunity maybe here we'll have a maybe people can provide some feedback on what more they'd like to hear um from us on on this really important subject matter so um and wrapping things up today so on behalf of the canadian hospice palliative care association and advanced care planning in canada um thank you so much joy um, founder of Dragonfly Advisory Services, um, for sharing your time with us today and, and your thoughts and ideas on the future of what um, we can do and what we and what we can do to make things better for others who are only beginning, maybe beginning their journeys. Um, so, for more information to reach Joy, you can visit her website at uh, www.dragonflyadvisoryservices, all one word, dot ca. And for those of you who may want more information or to download a printable advanced care planning workbook, you can visit our website at advancecareplanning.ca. And you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Um, until next time, be well and be safe. And thank you again, Joy, for your time. Thank you. It was humbling.